G'day there, you're watching the Aussie BIM Guru, and today we're running through Lesson 9 in my Learn Dynamo series. So previously you might have noticed I called the series a uh, lesson at this point, Geometry Fundamentals, um, but I've had a change of plan and instead of we're going to look at each type of geometry with a good demonstration. So in this case we're looking at points and lines, and you can sort of see the plan for the rest of the series here. So we're looking at different geometry types each, uh, each session. Um, getting more complicated as we go and finishing on a demonstration, but we're getting close to the end of the series now um, So hang in there So previously we looked at data and elements and how to place families uh, But now we're going to look at getting geometry out of conditions in Revit and manipulating and using that to create intelligent solutions So we're going to keep it Revit focused um, We're going to aim for some demonstrations at the end where we actually generate tower forms to get uh, masses and data um, rather than more abstract solutions like above. So there's some new terms that we need to learn uh, when we move into geometry in Dynamo. So Revit you might be more used to reference lines and planes, um, extrusions, blends and sweeps, um, but really Dynamo is a bit more like the conceptual massing environment in Revit. So you'll be using things like points, lines and edges um, which generate planes, surfaces and faces and ultimately they will also generate solids, lofts, and things like cuboids and spheres. Things like extrusions and sweeps do still exist in the Dynamo environment, but there's a lot of different names for them, which are more commonly used in um, computational programming, such as uh, lofts. So in a nutshell, we'll be looking at coordinate systems and points in this session. Um, in the next session, we'll be looking at the next layer, which is typically just edges, lines, vectors, polycurves, and polygons. And then we'll be looking at surfaces and faces, which can be combined into poly surfaces, and then meshes and solids um, in the, the last session. So where do we begin? It's quite a big topic to cover. Uh, geometry is quite complicated, and most tutorial series go far too in-depth on complicated mathematics, uh, which I will be trying not to, because people typically get lost at that point. Um, so we're looking at points and lines, but we may use some other geometry, uh, such as surfaces or lofts in this session, in order to most effectively demonstrate how to use these tools. But I'll point out when I'm using those functions, and I'll focus more on them in detail in future sessions. So we'll go straight to Dynamo. Uh, no time to waste. Already wasted enough. Um, for those that are following along with the series, you'll notice that I've upgraded to version 2.0.3, um, which is available on the Builds section on the Dynamo website. It's not the latest endorsed version, but it fixes a lot of bugs that came about in a few packages that conflicted. So I do recommend that people upgrade to that version, but don't upgrade to 2.1 because that won't work in anything except Revit 2020. And I'm on Revit 2019 currently. Okay, so we'll just start with points and how to generate them. So most of the geometry nodes in the dictionary are located up here under geometry. I'm typically going to be lightly touching on certain portions of this section, but you can sort of see the semantics I just discussed in each section. So you can see curves, points, solids, and surfaces. Uh, and there's also modifiers, uh, but we'll mostly be looking at points today. So there's a lot of ways to start points off, but the easiest way is points by coordinates. Um, you can either do points by coordinates in XY or XYZ. So the only difference with a point by coordinates XY is it will always assume that Z is zero. You'll see here I'm feeding in a range of zero through to 10 with a step of one and a range of 0 through to 5 with a step of 1 for my x and y, respectively. The reason I'm doing this is because you may recall that in a very early session I mentioned that I would show lacing and how that looks from a geometric perspective. So currently we are on automatic lacing. You can see we're generating 5 points. So my x and y are climbing by 1 respectively, but as soon as we run out of y values, the list is stopping. That's because by default, uh, points try to lace to their shortest list. So whichever list will finish first is where the list will finish. If you, if you force it to go to longest, you'll see that the last five points will actually generate uh, the, the right values for X, but they'll keep using the last value that was available in the list for Y, because we ran out of points here. Um, and likewise, if we do a cross product, we get every possible combination of the two, so we essentially get a grid. Uh, so these lacing combinators are quite helpful, and they will become quite quite used during this tutorial. And you can see here that when you do a cross product, it actually generates columns of points. So each of those sublists respectively represents a column of points. Um, so that's how you can isolate them as well. Because you can see they've broken into sublists. Anyway, we're gonna move on to the main tutorial at hand. Um, so we're gonna just open up this basic point generation workshop. 
Um, so previously we've been using things like uh, element get location in order to generate points in Revit. Uh, so we have been working with points to some degree, but we haven't been generating points uh, using geometry nodes and using it in a different way. So we're gonna be looking at a case study um, as a demonstration. Um, so we're gonna be looking at a ceiling a little bit like this, so that there's a waveform in the ceiling and each of those timber elements reaches down to, the, to that wave from a constant height, but not a constant base. So we're gonna find a way to basically attract a surface of points. Um, it's a very common way to introduce the concept of points in Dynamo, um, but with architectural focus here. So there's a few nodes by default with point co by coordinates. One is point origin. Um, this one's quite a basic node in that all it really does is generate a point at zero, zero, zero. So if I run this script, node I'm in manual mode, um, it just generates a zero, zero, zero point. In this case, we're not gonna use it, but sometimes that can be a helpful point to have. Um, note that the origin is gonna be the origin in Revit, um, not your project base point or your survey point. So it's important to understand where your model started from. And if you need to work from your project base point or your survey point, you may need to work relative to that point instead. And I can show you how to do that shortly. So we're gonna do point by coordinates. And I've already set up a, a range that we're gonna feed in to our point by coordinates. So we're not gonna use the X, Y in this case, we're just gonna use the Z with the Z of zero, which is effectively almost the same thing. Um, but I've, I've left it open so that we could plug in a Z value later if we wanted to. So essentially all we wanna do is create a grid of points. So we're gonna feed in a range. So I've set up a, a range for spacing and I've basically said that I start at zero with a spacing of 100 and then I wanna just set the size of my grid. So if I feed this range into X, and Y and apply a cross product and run. We should expect to see a grid of points emerge as a result. Uh, similar to what we were looking at before with our lacing. Um, we could also increase the size of the grid if we so wanted to increase the number of samples that we had. Um, I can go into automatic mode. Um, it, usually points generate quite quickly in automatic mode but at some point I may disable automatic mode um, just when I start generating some geometry, which will get a bit slower. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna generate an attractor point. So this is basically a point that will influence the wider grid. Um, I set up two sliders between zero and one, which are basically the percentage along the way of the maximum possibility. So I wanna have a point that can move around this space. So I'm gonna feed in the maximum item of the range here and detect that which it knows is a thousand. Obviously, if I increase the size of this, I will expect my maximum to increase as well. I'm then basically just setting up a code block saying I want to times the maximum times my percentage in the X and the Y direction. And that is my attractor point that will emerge. So what will happen now is I have a point that I can freely move around the grid. Notice that small point there, and that's my attractor point. And it's always respective to the size of my overall grid. So what I can do there, if it, maybe I'll just um, stop previewing my main grid so that you can see that point more easily. And you can see it there. So it's always scaling with the, um, the environment that I'm setting up because I've set up a, a percentage. Uh, so from here, we're basically gonna take this forward as a point. Um, you can reverse engineer points as well. So we can feed in a list of points and we can also just reverse engineer their X values, their Y values, and their Z values, which can be quite important when you're trying to isolate lists or order points based on a certain bunch of criteria, such as or sort them by Z, for example. But we'll just disconnect those for now. But good to be aware that those exist. All right, so we're gonna look at the translate node now. So the translate node isn't unique to points. Um, the translate node can be used for a lot of geometry types. You'll notice that its input is called geometry. So what we need is we need a direction. So in this case, we're calling on a vector. So if you're not aware of what vectors are, you probably need to probably go look this up because it's quite important. But a vector is more or less a direction in 3D space. It doesn't necessarily have to have a size. Um, it does have a magnitude, but it doesn't have to have a specific direction, uh, a specific distance. It could just be uh, a measurement of one as its magnitude, which is technically a distance, but it's not relevant to most vector applications. Really, it's just a direction. So in this case, we're saying that we wanna move at the Z axis, so we wanna move up in space. Um, there's a lot of other ways to generate vectors, but I won't go too far through them. 
You can say X, Y, or Z axis to generate a typical vector for either one. You can also do vectors by coordinates, which basically goes from the origin to a point that you specify. And you can say if you want to be normalized or not, so does it have a magnitude of one. You can also go between two points, and you can also use vector reverse to turn a vector around in the opposite direction. Using vectors, you can also do handy things like measure the angles about an axis between two vectors to compare the orientation of two objects. Um, and you can also find angles between vectors irrespective of axis. Um, but I recommend that you play with these if you think they're important to what you use. Um, but yeah, they can be quite fundamental. Um, but if I touched on them, we, we wouldn't have time. Okay, so we're gonna translate these points. So we're basically gonna push my grid of points up. So from here, we're gonna to need to map this to our maximum ceiling height or our maximum of the overall ceiling system. So I've set up two fields here. One is minimum ceiling height, one is maximum. So you can see here I can slide these and they change in increments of 50. I'm just gonna say 850, um, I'm gonna do 800 up to 1600. Um, so this is our lowest possible ceiling height. Okay, so we're gonna take that as our distance and you'll notice it straight away. We end up with a copy of that grid that's been offset. So as I change my maximum ceiling height, you'll expect that to also change in height as well because we're in automatic mode node. Okay, um, so from there, what we need to do is actually find the distance between the bottom and the attractor point. So to find out how sensitive it should be to that attractor point. So we're gonna take the distance from uh, our point or our point by coordinates back here and say, how close are you to the attractor point? And you'll see that we end up with a range of distances. And you recall that we use the map, the math remap range node in order to map ourselves back to a minimum and a maximum range to work with. And as you can probably guess, we're gonna be dealing with the minimum possible ceiling height, but then we're gonna take 100 from the maximum so that we never end up with a cylinder that is, that is zero because we will have one value that will always be the maximum uh, possible distance from the attractor point. So we'll just do that. And we should end up with a remapped range that is basically normalized between these, this value and this value here. Sorry, I need that to be our new max. Okay, so we have basically a list of points on the ceiling, and then we have a remapped range of distances here. So as you can probably guess, we needed another geometry translate in order to push, uh, again, our, our um, base points up by a certain certain distance. So we're gonna get the z-axis as our direction again. We're gonna take our distances here, and then we're gonna take our points by coordinates, which should give us a list of points that are offset based on how close or, or responsive to the attractor they are. So as I move the attractor point around, I should expect these points to respond. So note that waveform sort of taking effect. It's a little bit hard to see currently just because we're in point form at the moment, but we will go to solid soon. Uh, but because we're dealing with points, it's a lot faster. And note that, note that effect happening. So you can see that the attractor point is basically pulling the ceiling grid towards, towards it of that function that we've applied. There you go, so quite a, quite a strong, strong visual there that we're seeing. Okay, so we have uh, a set of points here. We have a set of points at the top and we can probably start ignoring these points as geometry creation at this point so we can stop previewing them. So we have a few ways we could deal with these points. One of them is that we have a list we have a set of sub lists that basically represent rows of points. We could generate a NURB, a NURB curve for each of those. And you can see there, that's what they'll look like when we generate them. Um, we could do a loft through those as well by cross sections to generate a surface. And you can see there the effect that we end up with. And basically as our attractor point moves, you'd expect our surface to respond to the attractor point. So that is one way you can make use of these to generate a, a quite a complex ceiling form. And you can obviously map adaptive components to this as well. So there's a lot of potential here, but we're just gonna turn off the preview for this and this and freeze that down. Um, we can also do start point and end point connections. So lines can be generated by points as well. Um, we can do 
by start point, direction, and length, or we can do by start point, end point. So we could say that all our line start points are the top of the ceiling, which you know is this one here, and the end points are here. And we get basically a set of lines that represent each of those. Obviously still abstract. Um, this hasn't become something in Revit yet. So we do have two options here for how we can deal with the geometry. We can keep it in Dynamo, but generate solids. So what, one thing we can do is take these as circles um, by center point radius. So this node basically demands that you give it a, I might just go to manual mode, give, you give it a radius and where are your center points. So we're gonna want our top and then also our middle center or our, our, our blanket ceiling as set of circles. We're gonna flatten those lists and merge them together and then transpose them so that each sub list represents this point and the point above. And we're gonna use solid by loft. So if we run that, we'll actually end up with a, a lofted form uh, between those cylinders. And you can see now we have geometry generated by this element. So we can really start to visualize what this thing looks like. Um, note that if you go to automatic mode now, it will be a little bit slower because it's got to run through a lot of processes to generate all that form. So you may may want to go to manual mode at some point around here. You can still drag the sliders, but notice it'll spin quite heavily. And depending on the power of your computer, maybe your computer might handle it better than, better than mine does. But you can see that mine's still catching up. So at that point, I recommend going into manual mode and just pressing, uh, pressing run every time you've found a new iteration of the ceiling that you want to explore. So if you run, you'll note that that preview should update. In a second, there we go. But what I might do is I'm just gonna go and freeze that portion as well. I might actually just uh, turn off my preview for my circles, turn off the preview for my loft, and I'll just refreeze this section so it stops running. Um, the last thing we can do is actually place families. So what I've done is I've built a two-point adaptive component family. Um, it's really just a cylinder extruded along a path between two adaptive points. And you might recall there was a node we looked at earlier called adaptive component by points. Um, so what we need to do is federate our points in so that each sublist contains the start and end point. So we're going to merge these two lists of points for the top and the bottom, and then we should be able to transpose them, I believe. Okay, we need to do a little bit of lacing here, note. So what we're going to want to do is, we're going to want to work at level, just trying to think of the lacing we need to do here. We might need to flatten those lists first as well, actually just so we can transpose them at the same level. There's probably probably a, a, um, a levels combination I'm not thinking of here that might get the job done. Um, but when in doubt, flattening a list usually works as well. Even if it does technically take a little bit longer. It's always good to turn off preview if you're ever pushing a list of points through um, from another node, because Dynamo will try and preview that set of points again for every time you pass it through a node. Um, even a list create, you'll want to turn that off and a list transpose as well. So if we feed these in now, I believe that the transpose should work. Yes, there we go. So if we feed this through now to our points and then our family type, and I'll just set us to longest lacing just to be sure that it makes one for every single combination. And I run this. Uh, okay. Arguments have issues. Okay, sorry about that. So the only thing that we needed to do differently there was not um, set our lacing to longest. So it turns out that that causes it to have issues. If you go to auto, it will know how to handle all the sub lists. Um, I think it's to do with the levels that we're working at. So now if I run that again um, with the same settings, just not the lacing, we'll actually get adaptive components built between those points. So you can imagine that this could be a ceiling in your project and it could have a much more complicated outline as well. You could be dividing a surface into points as well which we'll look at in a later session. Um, but there you go, you can see that it successfully generated that, that ceiling form. Um, obviously you can do this with conceptual massing as well, but there might be routines in Dynamo that you can set up in order to streamline this process instead of having to build a conceptual mass every time. So you can see just the power there. And I might just quickly show just another demonstration just really quickly.
of um, a couple of more complex ways of generating points, um, just just because I think they're quite important to understand as well. And they might have some geometric uses that you might find very helpful. So there's the option to also establish a coordinate system in Revit as well. You recall when I mentioned before that typically it will work at the Revit origin. Um, you may wish to offset that. So you may wish to actually set a coordinate system. Um, so you can set a coordinate system by X, Y origin or by X, Y, Z origin. Um, either one will work. It just depends on, I guess, the context of how you're setting it up. Typically X, Y, Z is probably more common because you may want to reach a coordinate system all the way up to the, the origin of your project base point, for example, instead. And this will let you work from there as your relative point of 0, 0, 0 when you work in Dynamo. So that can be quite helpful when you're working a long way from the origin. Um, from here, a lot of... Uh, point creation processes can actually call on that coordinate system. Typically with uh, the wording CS as its input is usually what it implies. You can also do um, points by Cartesian coordinates as well with a, a CS input as well instead. Um, so I've set up two sets of point generation here. One is a point by cylindrical coordinates. Um, you can see here that you can set the angles. I've set a range of zero through to 360 at increments of 15 degrees. And you can set up elevations as well. And I've said I want elevations from zero to six meters at increments of a meter. And then I've also said that my radius is just one figure. I've set it to a cross product. And then likewise, I've also set up a spherical coordinate system. So again, I'm working at an angle of zero through to 360 at a degree of 15 for what they call phi um, or phi, which is basically the, the incremental angle around a circle. And then theta as well. So in the other direction, so both around the sphere um, laterally and longitudinally as well. And I've just set my radius again to five meters. And you can see here that I've offset the coordinate system by 15 meters for the spherical system versus the cylindrical system. So now if I run that script, I should expect that I will see two sets of coordinates emerge, maybe in Dynamo at least. Okay. So if I preview these two systems and I do a zoom, a zoom fit, there you go. You can see that a cylindrical coordinate system and a spherical coordinate system are quite complex as well. And from there, you can deal with them in different ways. So a cylindrical coordinate system breaks its sublists by column, um, unless you transpose the points, and in which case you can deal with them in rows instead. Um, and likewise, a spherical point system will also do a similar, a similar breakdown as well. So we'll deal with them in basically rings around each level. So you can see that is basically how that's traveling down the circle in each sub list. So if I just expand um, my spherical list first, what I've done is I've chopped uh, each of those lists by the count of how many angles I have. And then I've transposed on one side. So I might just stop previewing these. So if I run this script, and I'll just preview those, you'll see that this is basically went and generated circles around uh, the latitude lines on, on here. Sorry, my longitude lines on here. And then my latitude lines are basically just a transposed version of those working the other way. So you can generate quite complex forms spherically using those. Um, likewise, with my cylindrical form, I can also deal with this too. So I can generate a uh, line best through, fit through points. And then I can also deal with circle by best fit through points to also generate meshes and lattices um, where I have control over all those points. You can see there, there's my circles and there's my lines. So just some techniques there that you can use to generate form as well using points. Um, but I think the basic version I used is probably a more common example of how you might want to use them architecturally. So I know there's quite a lot to take in in that session. Um, the next one's going to be a little bit more streamlined because I have a good example to show for it as well. Um, if you need any more help, there's a lot of stuff on geometry at the Dynamo Prana and the Dynamo Forums, and they will go in more depth on things like trigonometry. So if you are looking for advanced geometric techniques, that's probably where you're best off finding them. Um, I don't want to overcomplicate the series too much by focusing on them here. So hopefully you got a lot out of that session today. Um, our next session is going to be looking at curves and edges. And we're going to be actually getting some model edges from elements in a family and doing quite an interesting example of how you can process them in Dynamo.
So thanks for watching today's session. If you've got any feedback or any comments or queries, feel free to leave them down below. Um, and if you're, not, if you're not already following or subscribing, um, I'm sure by lesson nine you probably are, uh, feel free to, to follow. Um, I've released videos on a regular basis. Um, I look forward to seeing you in the next session um, and take care. Thanks. Bye.